Thank you, Emily, and thank you guys for coming tonight to listen to my spiel that I, I maybe some of you have heard before. A couple of people, if you've been in my class, you've heard some of my similar content about generational oriented issues. It's a really hot topic, and I get asked a lot to uh, speak about it here in Albuquerque. Uh, I think that um, you know people are picking up on the fact that that is it is a fairly hot topic, and people are interested in some of the differences that are. Uh, they're sort of apparent there in the workplace. Most of these focusing on what we'll talk about in a moment are the millennials that everyone is so scared of. It's, oh my gosh, we got these youngsters coming into the workforce to take our jobs and they're doing everything so differently. I can't possibly uh, handle this. So uh, thanks for coming tonight. I'm going to talk about generational workforce dynamics. And as I mentioned, this is one of my areas of emphasis that I do do a lot of research in. Um, and I try to you know, move into some of my classes as well. I've done work with Nishimba for many years. Uh, always been a great organization. If I could say anything about Nishimba, I'd say that it's a first class organization, provides a lot of opportunities, is very supportive of evidence-based research, right? So is certainly involved in collecting data from Hispanic business professionals and others. You know, the great thing about Nishimba is that it's not exclusive. We're a very inclusive group, need not be Hispanic nor have an MBA to join. We're happy to have you, um, however, however you'd like to join. Uh, and we collect a lot of data on workplace issues. Uh, and it's very useful. It was useful for me in my dissertation, and it's useful to a lot of other academics uh, who are trying to do work to improve the work experience of all people, not just those from underrepresented work, um, work groups. So great organization. We'll talk a little bit more about it later. But getting to the content, why we got you guys here tonight at 6.30 on a Thursday, right? Who wants to? Wednesday. See, I don't know what's going on. I don't know. Thursday, Wednesday, it's, it's today. It's today, right? It's the 26th. Um, so let's talk a little about generational workforce dynamics. Um, when we talk about generations, people tend to focus on year of birth. And they say, well, you were born in 1963, so you are a member of the baby boomer gener generation or something like that, right? But the reality is, is that while those age ranges give us some guide as to where you might fall in terms of generational dynamics, it's more about the, the important events that happen there, what we call salient events that occur that sort of impact your worldview at those periods of time. So for example, you might have been born as a Gen Xer by age group, but the reality is, is that you operate more like a millennial, or perhaps you're a little bit old fashioned, you operate more like a baby boomer. That's all very possible. And it has a lot more to do with your, what we call formative years experience. And as all of you know, those first 18 to 20 years of life, you're kind of trying to figure out who you are, what you're doing, and all that kind of stuff. And those are the events that really impact how we create our own identities. So let's look at the generations in today's workforce. Okay, and for the first time in history, we have four generations in the workforce at the same time. Okay, this is the first time this has ever occurred. And there's a lot of reasons for it. We've got people living longer. We've got uh, better healthcare services, although some of you might disagree. It is a little bit better than it was in the, the early 1900s, right? Um, we have the financial uh, crisis we had recently forcing people to work longer. Uh, with the longer life expectancies, we see people returning to work, or perhaps they've worked their whole lives to get to a particular level in an organization and say, hey, I've been doing this work, now I'm here, I'm gonna hang out and enjoy this job for a little while, right? So there's a lot of reasons and a lot of dynamics contributing to this. But the four generations in today's workforce, you see right here, okay? So first off is the silent generation, and these are the older people in our, in our workforce today, generally born between 1925 and 1945. But these are the folks whose worldview was shaped by the salient events of the Great Depression, World War II, et cetera, okay? And they have a credo, much like the other groups do, and theirs is, we must pay our dues and work hard. So this is a group that the American dream really rings true for, right? That if you work hard and try to work your way up in an organization, that it's gonna pay off. That hard work is rewarded, okay? And that it's not a true statement for many of the other generations, right? But definitely in this older generation, that was something that paid off. So next, the next oldest group that is starting to become of sort of traditional retirement age, but is sticking around a little bit, uh, are the baby boomers. Now, hopefully, unlike some of my classes, I do not need to explain to you the phenomenon of the baby boom <laughs> and how that happened. I had to go into uh, very explicit detail with some of my students and explain to them that after World War II, when the troops came home, 
men and women love each other very much, <laughs> and then, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So. Exactly. You know, TV wasn't yet. Yeah, it wasn't a big deal. So anyway, so hopefully you guys all understand how that kind of happened. Baby boom, spike in birth rates. We're good. Okay. About 1946 to 1964, lots of salient events here that have a much different impact than we saw with the Great Depression and World War II, right? The Kennedy assassinations, right? Robert and John, uh, Martin Luther King assassination, moon landing, Vietnam War, etc. right? Very much involved in counterculture movements. Uh, you know, the whole 60s, 70s kind of, kind of culture that we think of. But their credo is, if you have it, flash it, right? Hey, I earned this. Hey, I make a six-figure salary. Yeah, I bought that Mercedes, and come check it out, right? And come check out the leather interior, too. It's really nice, right? So definitely very status-oriented, right? Interested in titles and organizations. Now, interested in, in getting pay and moving up, but also the status that's associated with a title, right? This really became en vogue when this group became a main thrust in the workplace, right? When we saw these folks move up. That's when we saw all these sort of executive vice president, senior executive vice president titles really become sort of the hot trend, okay? And it stuck around, but this is where it kind of started. So next we have the group that I am a proud member of, the Gen Xers, sometimes referred to as the slacker generation, okay? Uh, born between 1965 and 1980. Sometimes they use um, the, the boundaries of Kennedy to Star Wars. So if you were born after the assassination of JFK, into when Star Wars was kind of a big deal. You know, we all play with Star Wars figures as kids, or at least I did. Um, and our salient events were things like AIDS, oral contraceptives, the Cold War, this thought of this sort of red menace kind of thing of, you know, the Soviets are going to invade us one day and the world is probably going to end in this really sort of doom or gloom kind of situation. You know, we're the latchkey kids, uh, you know, dual income parents, all of this kind of stuff. So a lot of changes where we saw the surge in dual income families and that really be the norm. And our credo is, whatever. World's going to end, whatever, right? No big deal. So next we come to the, uh, the group that is entering the workforce currently, right? And have been for several years. And the folks that I see in class on a daily basis, although as I get older, they stay the same age. And that's one of the uh, occupational hazards that I have. But uh, we're seeing the younger generation, in fact, the, the next, the, the IY or Gen Z folks are, are coming into, into the college classroom. But the millennials or Generation Y folks, which you may hear differentiated by some people, I lump them together for multiple reasons. We can have an argument about that later if you're really stirred up about it. Um, I like to use the term millennial just because I feel Gen Y doesn't give them enough credit. Seems kind of lazy. What's after X? Oh, how about Y, right? I mean, just throw the next letter on there. Right? So it seems to me that millennial is kind of a better term for them. Uh, and based on when they became sort of a, a large population force would be around the millennium. Born approximately between 1981 and 1993, we're not entirely sure where that cutoff is because we're just starting to see the dynamics of this next group that's coming up. And the salient events are things like MTV, the internet, 9-11. These are tremendous influences to how we view the world today and quite different than anything that's happened before. And our credo, or not our credo, but their credo is a very op optimistic kind of viewpoint, which is, hey, let's make this world a better place that we as individuals have the opportunity can actually make change in the world, whether that be on a social basis, a political basis, or what have you, right? That, hey, there is positive change that can be made and we're gonna do it. So, hey, great, optimistic. It's coming back, right? Well, we'll see. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> so the thrust of today's talk, because most of the stuff we have issues with, or people tend to have issues with is, how are these changes going to impact my workplace? How are all these young people coming in into the workplace going to impact me? And we'll see in a second that the statistics play out and say that, like it or not, you got to deal with the millennials, OK? So OMG, they're coming fast. Millennials in the workforce, how can this be? If you don't know what OMG means, we probably need to have the sort of uh, remediation class we'll have after this. And I'll walk you through all of these sort of common parlance kind of things. So, does anyone understand this particular statement right here? A couple people shaking your heads? Yeah. Text talk, right? Does anyone know why we are here today? Right. How about this? Anybody translate that for me? 
Everyone's kind of mumbling to themselves. Your text speech here. Well, there are actually um, translators on the internet, just like you can translate from Spanish to English, you can translate from text speak to English and English back to text speak. But if you can read this, and this is what it says. It says, good morning. I'm glad we have the opportunity to talk about the influx of millennials into the workplace. As you'll come to learn, they are quite different than other generations, but this isn't necessarily bad, just different. Okay? Now, if you were able to translate that and you understand it, you think you're pretty hip, right? You think you're pretty, pretty cool, right? Well, guess what? You are already behind the times. Because I show that to my students and they say, quote, that is like reading a text message from my mom. <laughs> okay? My mom, who thinks she's cool using her Motorola Razor or LG chocolate phone to send me a text message, right? The reality is that everyone now has a smartphone, right? Look around, they got an iPhone, they got a Samsung Galaxy, they got whatever that big thing is that looks like you're holding a book to your head when you're making the phone call, right? They've got those things and it auto-corrects your text, right? So we even perceive millennials and Gen Y folks to communicate in a particular way, yet they communicate in a totally different way. If you were to go to a different country and you were to talk to someone, right? You go to Mexico, you're gonna start talking to someone. You go to France, you talk to someone. You're gonna assume you're communicating cross-culturally and there's a different language. But we neglect to observe the fact that millennials are technically a different culture and we're communicating cross-culturally, right? I get emails from students that say things like, anything going on in class today, right? And some people say, oh, so unprofessional. Can't believe students would communicate with their professor like that, blah, blah, blah. Well, first of all, you should see how they communicate face to face with their professors. <laughs> and second of all, isn't that more of a teachable moment, right? Can't we say, hey, look, you know, if you're working in the business world, blah, 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 this is probably the reality, et cetera, et cetera. Or should I feel flattered that they feel comfortable enough to talk to me like that? Or should I assume that there's a cultural difference? Right? We jump to this conclusion that that's wrong. We're right and you're wrong. Okay? So we're going to get into that a little bit more later. So a little bit more. Who are these millennials? We know what ages they are. We know what's important to them salient event-wise. But they are an age cohort fancy talk for a generation, with unique formative years experience. So the first 20 to 23 years of life, approximately born between 1980 and 1993, currently 80 million members. Okay, so almost a third of the United States population are these millennials. As I mentioned before, age is only a number. Okay, right, now some of you are saying that, yeah, that's right, I'm 40, but I feel 18, right? Well, it also has to do with the influences on you personally and how you approach life, right? Because Gen Xers or Boomers can be more millennial than even younger folks, right? It depends on those sociocultural influences that you have on how you were raised, et cetera. Childhood is a very important formative years experience that we don't focus enough on, especially in management research, right? Because a lot of who you are, how you approach things, how you approach people, how you interact with others has to do with that experience, right? And how you were sort of taught to act. And even though maybe we take, you know, our college years and later to try to unteach ourselves some of those things, right? Modeling is very powerful. We all catch ourselves and say, oh my gosh, I sound like my mom. Oh, I sound like my dad, right? It happens all the time. If it hasn't happened yet, just wait. It's pretty scary. Anyway, so why should we care about this group? Well, over 60% of employers have cited tension between employees attributed to generation of birth. 60%, over half of employers cite tension based on age, okay? Take generation of birth out of there and substitute in race, ethnicity, gender, religion, political beliefs. You name it, right? And you've got huge litigation, right? You've got front page of the Wall Street Journal type stuff, right? But when you throw generation and age in there, it's not only accepted, it's sometimes encouraged, right? You say, well, you gotta earn your stripes, you gotta put in your time, right? And if you're under 40, you're not a protected class. You can't be discriminated against for your age for being young, although it happens all the time. And it's something that's not taboo like race or religion. It's something that we encourage, that we say, you gotta put in your time, you gotta get your tenure, you gotta work up, you gotta go up the ladder, you gotta spend at least six months in this position before you can apply for this, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the reality is that 40%, 40% 4 
of today's workforce will retire in the next five to 10 years? 40%, think about that. That leaves a huge gap in employment. Okay, we talk about, oh, there are no jobs for college graduates. You know, there are difficulties finding opportunities. Well, just wait. There's going to be plenty of opportunity. Now, why would there be plenty of opportunity? For multiple reasons, right? There have been delayed retirements, right? We have a gap in terms of the number of people who are qualified in Generation X to fill the positions left by the baby boomers, right? We have a rebounding economy, stock market improving, right? With people who are underemployed who will very soon move out of those positions. There's a lot of reasons, but statistics indicate from multiple sources that we have a large percentage of people moving out. So better get used to the millennials being involved here, okay? 70% of older employees are dismissive of millennials' abilities, generally attributed to lack of understanding. They figure, you're young, you're coming in here, there's no way you could possibly know what you're doing. Your way of doing things is wrong, my way of doing things is right, okay? And this is a traditional value that we hold in organizations, and corporations in particular, that the new guy wants to change things up, right? And we gotta beat him down. The nail sticks up, we gotta hammer it down, right? right? Gotta fix it up, right? But also, what's important to remember is that a slight age difference can also equal a large interpersonal difference. So we have to be careful when we're creating stereotypes about these groups, right? So we might assume, well, all millennials, everyone born in 1980 and 1993, they all have these same characteristics. Well, not necessarily, right? And these cuspers, and there's a lot of research focusing on cuspers, people who are born on the cusp of generations, and how they exhibit um, characteristics of both generations are very unique. So me, for example, I am on Facebook, Friend me, most of you, if you want, go ahead. Right? Anyone else on Facebook? Should be a lot of people. Pretty popular, you might have heard of it, social networking, kind of a big thing, right? So when you first get a Facebook account, the first thing that you do is cyberstalk old girlfriends, right? Because right? you want to see what they're doing, right? right? So you look for people, yeah, high school girlfriends, well, what do you do now? Oh, yep, too bad, you missed out, right? But, <laughs> So you do that, right? So I did that when I joined Facebook, because that's what you do. I'm, I'm not proud of it, but I did. <laughs> but also I looked for people I went to high school with, right? So I looked for people who I graduated from high school with, and on Facebook, there were quite a few people, maybe like five, six pages of people who had Facebook accounts. So you know, I clicked through and I friend the people that I knew and all that kind of stuff. And then I said, well, you know what? I know people who graduated the year after me who are slightly younger, because I'm a social guy. That's how I roll, right? <laughs> So look at that, and there were like 12 to 15 pages of people who had Facebook profiles. So obviously, I am on the cusp of an age group where we see people use social networking at a tremendously higher rate than people who are slightly older than me, right? So, right in the, so people could make assumptions about how I use social networking, but it might not necessarily apply. And that's an anecdotal remark, but it's very important to remember that you can't make assumptions about a group because there can be very minute differences you know, attributed to spikes in technology uh, improvements, decreases in the price of access to technology, whatever, okay? The fact that I left high school and it made it safer for you to be on the internet, I don't know. It's, it's, that was a joke, but that's okay. Anyway, okay. <laughs> so why is this group so different? Well, unlike Generation X, parents have been available and involved. The helicopter parents, of which many of you may be, but since I've only spoken to you on the phone about your graduate students here at UNM, uh, I wouldn't recognize you, and it's probably a good thing. But it's, the pendulum has swung back tremendously. So Gen Xers, we saw dual income families, we saw institutionalized daycare, et cetera, right? So parents not at home and not as involved, right? So rather than the pendulum swinging back to sort of this homeostasis position, where you have a reasonable amount of engagement from parents, we see it swing back the other way. We have over-involved parents creating the sort of Barney culture that I talk about, right? The gold stars and hugs that we give to everyone. The participation trophy, orange slices, Capri Suns, and certificates that we give to people after every soccer game, right? We'll get into that in a second. But they're a very idealistic group. And in fact, I see the differences, not as much anymore, but in the recent past in my graduate versus undergraduate courses. I hand out uh, an article that I like to, uh, to talk about, and it has to do with an RA, a resident advisor at Arizona State University, who was required to do some diversity training for his job, okay? So he was required to go do this training, and then he could be a resident advisor, work with students who have problems, et cetera. And he felt that this training, uh, this diversity training, was um, against his religion. He felt he was being discriminated against, right? 
so I hand this, this article out, it's a newspaper article, to my students and say, so what do you think about this? You know, it's a diversity issue. I teach a diversity class. What do you think about this? You know, how should this guy address this issue? Right? What, should, what should be done? If, should there be an accommodation? How should you approach it? And the undergraduate class, they say, well, he shouldn't have to do the training. Right? He feels uncomfortable. If you feel uncomfortable, you shouldn't be forced to do anything. And that's the case. Right? They should make a special training just for him, et cetera, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. Right? OK, interesting. Cut to evening class, graduate students. Article, handout, right? older students working. What should you do? What would you do if you're the person? What would you do if you're the organization? He says, suck it up. <laughs> Too bad, man. Everyone does training they don't want to do. Right? It's part of the job. Find a different job. If you don't like the training, find a different job. Right? So we have the idealists in the younger group saying, well, yeah, we're special. You have to do whatever we want. Right? You the older group saying, suck it up. Too bad. Right? Very different. We all do training we don't like. Right? I have to do hazardous materials training for my job here at UNM. Do you see any hazardous materials around here? I don't, I don't work in a lab. Come on, man. Anyway. So they've grown up with increased education, educational expectation, and diversity, right? Educational expectation, we have approximately 28% of the United States has a uh, bachelor's degree, OK? I think it's 48 to 53%, depending on what you look at, have some college or a two-year degree. That's a huge percentage, OK? So today's bachelor's degree is yesterday's high school diploma. Okay, 9% have master's degrees. Half of a percent have doctoral degrees. The expectation is that you're going to go to college, right? In New Mexico, we let you go for free, right? You graduate from high school, hey, go, you got to go. That is the expectation, which is much different than we've seen in the past, okay? They also have a much more diverse group of people that they surround themselves with. When I was a kid in the 80s, the Cosby shows on TV, oh my gosh, there are black people on television and they're professionals, oh my gosh. Wow, how far have we come? Oh, Will and Grace, oh, we have gay people on television. Oh my gosh, what, this is a huge uproar. Oh, it's not a big deal anymore, right? The popular cultural influences that we have are much more, much more diverse, right? We see people who are biracial, multiracial, multicultural, multiethnic on television, right? Look at the people who are marketed to children, right? They tend to be of multiple ethnicities or races. And this is very calculated. The idea is that this appeals to that demographic that children don't see color quite as much, which is a great thing. Now, we're not all the way there, right? There are still issues, right? In other states more than others, right? But the expectation is that, yeah, there are differences in people, and I'm OK with that. It's still an issue, but not nearly as big as an issue. Much more tolerant in terms of ty types of people because of this. And in fact, 48% have some form of body modification. By body modification, I mean a non-standard piercing, and a standard piercing would be for a woman to have their, her ears pierced one time, or a visible tattoo, okay? 48%. Okay? So the biggest problem I see people talking about with millennials is, how can I put this person in front of my customers, right? They got a tattoo, they got a nose ring, they're this, they're that, et cetera, et cetera. Well, guess what? Your customers are probably looking like that too, okay? 48% is a large percentage. Would you rather have someone who doesn't have a nose ring, or would you rather have someone who can do the job? That's the bottom line, OK? Technology is a huge thing, right? The internet, right? When I was in college, when I went to UNM here, I had to walk over to what's ITS now, used to be called CERT, right? To do text-based internet web surfing on the Netscape. Do you remember that? On a huge computer with this big monitor, right? Right? When I did research on the internet, I didn't, just, I didn't go to Google. What I had to do was go to the library and use something called the Reader's Guide. Yeah. Anybody remember that? It's a big red book, so you got to flip through it, and then you got to find the thing, and then you got to write this down, and then you got to find where it is in the card catalog. Some of you guys are looking at me like, what's this old man rambling about? Right? Then you have to go pull it from the shelf, and then you would Xerox copy it, then you would actually read it, and you use a highlighter and stuff. Right? Now what do you do? All right, Google it. I don't know, Google it. Siri, what is blah, 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 right? <laughs> you don't have to Google it anymore. And I received a paper a couple semesters ago, works cited, one thing, www.google.com. That was it. <laughs> yeah, I probably need to do a little more work on that one. Yeah, so, yeah. But things like YouTube, MySpace, if you're ghetto, you're still on MySpace, uh, <laughs> Facebook, reality television, et cetera. 
has created a perception of this group as, and this is a very scientific term, attention whores, right? <laughs> look at me, look at my reaction video to watching this other video, <laughs> right? Oh, here's a picture of what I'm about to eat and you're not, right? I'm so important, I gotta tweet this out because Facebook updates are just too slow. I gotta tweet these things, right? I'm so important, look at me, I'm special, right? That's how this, this, this generation has come to be. Well, supporting this is a very popular statistic, which you may have heard before, that a study in 2006 showed that millennials have the highest ever recorded scores on the narcissistic personality <laughs> inventory. Well, what a surprise, right? Now, the caveat here is that, as with all statistics, or like this sort of statistic, what I call is schmatistics, right? They, these are things that are kind of skewed sometimes, and you can use them in, in certain ways. The reality is that every youngest generation is always the most narcissistic, okay? Youth breeds narcissism, okay? Think about babies. Look at the baby, look at the baby. Oh, the baby is walking. Oh, he spit up. Oh, he's crawling. Oh, how cute, the baby, the baby, the baby. They need you to do things for them, so of course they're narcissistic. They're not able to have sort of empathic sort of feelings. As they get older, well, maybe after they reach those teenage years, then they move out of the narcissism a little bit. Now, the important thing to remember is these are the highest ever recorded scores, okay? But over the generations, we see narcissism scores going up. So something's going on here, okay? And these folks are narcissistic. I, I'm not gonna deny that, but it's not as bad as you think. They have a lack of interest in traditional news media. They are not sitting down at 6.30 or 6 o'clock, I don't even know when it comes on, to watch Brian Williams, okay? They want to have multiple messages. They want to multitask. If they're going to watch a news program, they're going to watch a daily show. They're going to watch uh, Colbert. They're going to watch something like that. They're going to go on the internet. Right? They're not going to sit down and watch the evening news. They want to get multiple things done at once, entertained and news. Right? Not single site viewing. Okay? Positive here, don't feel cheated by society like Gen X, baby boomers, etc. Haven't lived through, well, up until recently, big governmental scandals like Watergate. Think about the impact that that had on the trust in, these, in the large organization of the US government, right? But feel that there is an opportunity to make a change, right? Fueled a lot by the election of President Obama, which was really a grassroots effort led mostly by young people, okay? So whether or not you agree with him politically, that sends a message to these individuals that you really can make an impact, you can make a change. There can be large sweeping differences from a small group of people that build to a larger group. They take longer in school, are more cautious in making decisions, and only 37% graduate college in four years. So that actually makes our UNM graduation rate look pretty good when we know that only 37% graduate in four years, right? It takes a long time. But the, but the reality of these folks is that they take longer, right? And the parents are sort of um, codependent in this relationship. Yes, take your time take some classes, figure out what you want to do, right? They didn't necessarily have that luxury, so they want their children to do it. And these parents who sort of incubate these issues, and I'm not going to name any names, but I have a feeling some of you might be in this group, are the helicopter parents, okay? And what are the helicopter parents? They are people who hover and then swoop in and usually mess things up and then swoop out, okay? <laughs> They heavily control the educational experience. Phone calls, emails come from parents of my undergraduate and graduate students, okay? It happens, okay? Everyone's like, no, I would never do that. Yeah, talk to me in a couple years, we'll see. Right? This is a problem, right? We have something called FERPA, Federal Education Rights Privacy Act. I am not allowed to discuss information about people in my classes, right? These people are adults. They're over the age of 18, okay? Um, but they call me. Oh, you know, uh, Joe didn't do very well in the last exam. He just doesn't really understand, you know. Maybe you could help him out, give him some extra credit, or do some extra tutoring with him, right? Not uncommon, okay? In fact, it goes further than this. Uh, this anecdote I have here is from one of my former students who said he had one of his employees' moms, <laughs> mommy called to complain about his performance evaluation, and he was a professional engineer. This guy worked in HR. So not only does he have a degree in engineering, but he has a professional engineer certification, which takes more, right? But his mommy <laughs> called. Didn't like his performance eval. And get this, it wasn't a negative performance eval. It wasn't perfect, right? 
yeesh. Right? So this all comes from what I like to call the gold collar syndrome. Not blue collar, not white collar, gold collar. I don't throw trash, I don't make copies, I don't get coffee. I've got somebody that does that, because I'm special. Right? <laughs> These are the boomerang kids, right? They've taken four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years in college, right? They've taken maybe six to nine credit hours a semester, right? They've worked really hard, so after college, <laughs> they come home <laughs> because they deserve a break, right? Mom's gonna, you know, take care of you. Oh, come on. Oh, Mijo, you work so hard. Come on. Let me do your laundry. It's okay. Go ahead, sleep till noon. It's fine. I know you like to watch Judge Judy at two. It's okay. It happens, right? What's the incentive to go work? Right? They're not looking for a blue collar job, not looking for a white collar job. It's a gold collar job. The job doesn't matter. The expectations are the same because as Barney the purple dinosaur told them, I'm special, damn it. I am special. I'm a leader. I'm special. There's no one like me. And I'm special. Right? <laughs> Guess whose fault that is? The parents a little bit. The parents just a little bit. Okay? Right? So if you've been told this your whole life, you've been told you're special, right? And not that people aren't special, and if I'm tearing down anyone's dreams, I apologize. <laughs> but think of the expectations we're setting up for these people when they go into the workforce. I'm special. Hey, man, you don't realize how special I am, right? My undergraduate HR majors. Hey, you're graduating. What kind of job are you looking for? Pfft, director of HR. <laughs> Vice President of Human Resources. I might settle for a VP of Compliance job. I don't know, it just depends, right? So this is a terrible group of people, right? Well, no, okay, that's not where I'm going with this. I'm actually a very pro-millennial person. Okay, I'm just giving you guys the info. Just trying to, I'm tearing you down to build you up here, okay? <laughs> they're not bad, they're just different, okay? And with challenge comes great opportunity. Many erroneously think, well, you're going to have to change once you start working. You got to work 80 hours a week, and that's how we do it here. And if you don't do that, you're not going to succeed. Well, guess what? Based on the numbers, not happening. Okay? When you've got 40% of the workforce leaving in five to 10 years, guess who's going to dictate how organizations run? The high talent millennials. Okay? Because when you look at turnover, and I've done some research on turnover, and who leaves organizations, right? So who leaves organizations? <clears throat> it's actually a curvilinear relationship. Okay? So turnover relationship actually looks like this. Okay? People leave organizations are high performers because they got a lot of opportunities, right? And they can go elsewhere. And low performers because they suck and they get fired, right? <laughs> or we make life uncomfortable for them and they leave. Right? So unless there is something linking you to the organization, and this is called the unfolding model of turnover, something keeping you in the organization linked to either the community, the organization, or other people, right? Oh, my spouse has this job, my kid's in school, I really like the people that I work with, etc. Unless you have those, what we consider extraordinary uh, circumstances, most places, theoretically, have a relatively mediocre workforce. Okay, unless there's something else linking you to the organization. That's why there's such a push for all of these you know, work-life programs to get people interested and involved in working and the people that they work with. This is the whole idea of the company picnic. It's nothing new, right? Getting people to like each other so that you want to stay working there. Okay? So unless an organization is millennial ready, it's going to be even more difficult to attract and retain top talent. So this is an issue now, but when you have a smaller pool of people and a large pool of jobs, those top performers, doesn't matter how many piercings and visible tattoos they have, right? It's a war for talent, okay? So let's think for a second why this group is so different and why they've been led to think in this particular way, right? Parental influence and participation, right? Things like MTV, which even when it shows music videos now, doesn't show the whole music video, or it shows it with this, all this crap going across the bottom and the thing on the side and the thing scrolling, it's like overloaded impact, right? Multitasking is the norm, 
right? Everything is multitasking, okay? The internet is huge. You've got it in the palm of your hand all the time, right? Any question you want answered is a couple keystrokes or a question to Siri away, right? The fact that I'm special, why don't you understand that? My mom understands it, but you don't for some reason. How can I communicate to this to you, right? The importance of constant, immediate feedback, right? Hey, how come you haven't graded my exam from two hours ago, right? I don't know, because I had to eat lunch and use the bathroom? I don't mean, there's, there's things I gotta get done here, you know? The immediate feedback, the sort of, you know, this, this sort of video game culture where everyone wants to interact and interface and do things in real time, the concept of homework or grading exams doesn't really mesh with that whole thing, right? And the overemphasis of constructive criticism, right? All the rage now is sandwich feedback, right? I'm not a proponent of sandwich feedback, but anyone ever heard of sandwich feedback? So sandwich feedback is the idea that you tell someone something positive, then you tell them the meat of the matter, the real thing you want to tell them, then you lay something positive on top, right? Well, any psychologist will tell you that recency is a big effect that happens with people, right? So they're going to walk away with the last thing that you told them, most likely, right? And so while sandwich feedback is good and we do need to tell people positive things, sometimes it's a double-edged sword. If I tell you two positives and one negative, you're going to walk away from the situation thinking that it's a positive outcome, when in reality, you could be a step away from getting fired. Okay? And when we try to be overly constructive and not as direct as we necessarily need to, especially with millennials, we really are walking on a dangerous line here. Because millennials, it, there's nothing in their makeup that says they're not receptive to feedback. In fact, this is a group that responds very well to structure and very detailed feedback. Okay? They want to do well because they're special, because okay? they can perform. Right? But an overemphasis of constructive <laughs> criticism becomes a problem with any group of people. So what do you do? So here's the crux of it. I could be your typical academician. I could stand up here and talk about it and say, well, there's a problem, but I don't know what to do about it. So I'll give you a few, a few samples. But the reality is, is that what you do is just basic good management practices. When we have a crisis. We have a new group enter the workforce. We have a group we don't know how to deal with. All the recommendations that whatever consultant you bring into your organization and pay them big bucks are going to tell you is basic solid, sound management practices and principles, okay? But it takes a crisis for people to remember what these things are. Because when things are going well and we've got a big labor pool and we've got a lot of opportunities and a lot of different people we can pull from, it's not as necessary, right? But when you have a limited pool and you're fighting for talent, you gotta really focus on that. So especially with millennials, recruiting and retention is the key. They think they're special, and, and you are, you're special, okay? <laughs> But make them feel special. What's wrong with that? And they're going to stick around. That's that unfolding model of turnover. Create linkages to the organization, right? Some positives that we see here with this group. Pay is not the number one priority. Flexibility and freedom, work-life balance is valued much more than pay. Hmm. That could be leveraged to competitive advantage, right? Instead of judging them for making that decision, why don't we use that to everyone's advantage? Grow the pie, right? Internships are incredibly valuable. Hands-on experience and responsibility is craved, quote, more than money. Now, this does not mean go hire a bunch of unpaid interns for slave labor, but what it means is these folks want to do what needs to get done to have a seat at the table. They want to be listened to and have the opportunity to give input, right? So to them, the status of a title or you know, a certain pay grade isn't as important. These are the straight to the top mentality folks, and I see it more and more every year. You have a problem with your professor, right? 10, 15 years ago, you have a problem with your professor, you go to the professor, right? And if that doesn't work, then you go to the department chair, then you go to the associate dean, then you go to the dean. Now, you got a problem with the professor, they go straight to the dean. If not there, they go to the president, right? Why? I'm special. I don't have to go through that hierarchy, right? Unfortunate or not, that's the reality. The straight to the top mentality is there. How about altering job expectations to boost appeal? Rather than saying, you need A, B, and C for this job, leave that. You need these criteria here. But here's what's going to happen if you work for me for two years. You're going to come out with X, Y, and Z credentials. Okay? You're going to have the opportunity for this other job okay? because you've done this work for me. You're turning a, a job description inside out. 
Okay? A company that's done this is Xerox. When I was at Arizona State, Xerox would hire a ton of our graduates. Okay? They had a great management training program. They offered a lower starting salary, but people would go to work for them because this management training program was so valuable that when you graduated from it, you had offers from tons of Fortune 500 companies. Right? You had to sign with them, you had to work with them for three years. It was a little bit lower pay, but it's a great opportunity. Right? So what do you think happened after that three years of that investment by Xerox in them? They stuck around. Why? Because the organization made them feel special and invested in them and showed that they have value. People love development opportunities. They hate training, right? You send me to leadership development, oh, awesome, right? You want me to be a leader. You're bringing in some, you know, slick dude to talk to me. You send me to hazardous materials training, <laughs> right? I'm not going to be that into it. People love development. They hate training, okay? But if you invest in people, it works. It pays off. It sends the message that they're special and valued. Mentoring programs, not work parents. Okay, it's not what I'm looking for here. Helicopter parents at work, then you got this whole strange thing. Mentoring programs, one-on-one -on -one relationships, real relationships between people, right? Creating value, creating that extra linkage to the organization. This is nothing earth-shattering that I'm, that I'm talking about here. Mentoring programs show value in multiple indicators of workplace uh, happiness, fairness, success, productivity, et cetera. And you know what the biggest value of mentoring programs normally is? Is the reverse mentoring benefits that you see. What the mentee provides to the mentor, okay? So it's a two-way street. I had a guy that worked at a credit union a couple years ago, came to one of my talks about generational issues, and you know, he did something really simple. He said, you know, I had a lot of turnover at my branch. The tellers, you know, were these kids who are in college or maybe about to graduate high school, and they would turn over a whole bunch, right? much more quickly than they had in recent years. And he's like, you know, they never talk to each other. And he's right, they're not building relationships as part of the issue, right? They go into the break room, they pop in their, their earphones and they listen to some music or they play a video game or they do whatever, right? And so what he decided to do of his own volition, which is a great idea, is he started talking to them. And he said, hey, what are you listening to? You know, what's the cool hip music with you kids today, right? The guy was much older than them, right? And so the kids tell him, you know, you know, whatever, this is what I'm listening to, that's what I'm listening to. And so he goes and asks his nieces and nephews or his kids or something and said, hey, what's the cool music, right? So he is taught how to download it on iTunes and listens to it. And he goes up to him and he says, hey, have you heard the new single from, insert name of not actually cool band right here, right? Like Justin Bieber or something, right? And of course they laugh and they go, no, ha, 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 no, I'm listening to whatever is actually cool. But just the action of making some effort with those individuals paid off. He gave an inch, they gave back a mile. Turnover went down. A lot of those folks stuck with the credit union for a period of time, moved up in the organization, right? He created a relationship with them. He showed interest in what they were interested in, right? Is that realistic for you to do with everyone in your organization? No, right? But demonstrate, doing something to demonstrate your value in your employees can pay off quite dramatically. Okay? Something that actually shows value, not some sort of perfunctory family picnic that you have once a year that everyone hates to go to because they get caught sitting next to and talking to the IT guy all the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. IT guys are awesome. Love them. Compressed work week, right? Changing work schedules. What's the problem with this? People say, well, that's not the way I did it. So? Right? We're not saying less work. We're just saying a different schedule. Right? If you're competing for talent, you've got to make some changes. Right? Telecommuting, that means not working. Nah. Depends, right? Well, what do you need to do? You need to sell culture in addition to pay and benefits. What's binding people to the organizations? What do my students do presentations on in their organizational behavior class? Right? Google, Southwest Airlines. Right? They all want to work for Google because I can bring my dog to work. It's so awesome. And they have, a, they have a cafeteria and you can eat whatever you want. They have nap rooms and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> what are all these things? They are demonstrating interest in the employee, right? We value you as a person, right? What do you need to do? Now, there's some evidence to show that some of these really expanded work-life programs tend to backfire because then people are only at work all the time. But they sell the culture to the outside world. Everyone wants to work for Google, right? Wouldn't that be so awesome, right? You can 
bring your dog and you know they've got this big campus and it's cool and it's all this kind of stuff right those are the links that keep people rethink career path structures right these folks think that they're going to be that credit union teller and their next job is ceo of the credit union right it's not that they don't understand career paths, but they need to have a career ladder drawn out for them. When you turn those job descriptions inside out, lay out the path, right? That's the job you want? Okay, let's work backwards. Here's how it goes. I'm mentoring you right now. You go from here to here to here to here. Very easy for them to follow these programmatic type steps, right? Very receptive to that type of information. We just gotta give it to them, okay? Tell them what comes next. Job descriptions not only include what they need for the job, but what are they going to learn? What are you going to do for me? How are you going to develop me as an individual? Because there's 30 of us, and I know I've got the fewest piercings. Okay? <laughs> so if you want to hire me, right, what are you going to do for me? No, but when we have people that you're trying to get the, the, the highest, most talented people, you need to sell yourselves, right? Not everyone's going to come begging at your door for a job like they have been the past four or five years. Okay? So in conclusion, millennials do not lack work ethic. They're just looking for some different things, okay? Family is gonna be involved, maybe even in the workplace, okay? Work-life balance maybe doesn't mean less work. It means less burnout. Think about this group. These are folks who have lived through you know, this whole financial crisis. They've, they've seen uh, their parents or aunts and uncles, grandparents' pensions squandered by people who are unethical, et cetera. They have pretty much of a lack of trust in big business, right? So they're saying, I'm not gonna create my whole worth around a simple job. It's much broader than that, right? Who I am is much more important. It's the balance of work and life. So maybe that means less burnout, right? Maybe they got it figured out and we're the ones who are really kind of left holding the bag, right? You never know. Expect to give up some control and be open. Give them a seat at the table. Create an in-group, right? Don't, don't try not to create an in-group, out-group dynamic. Create value for the employee. Development programs instead of training. And finally, you got to get ready because if you don't change, they're going to find someone who will. <laughs>